Hi, welcome back. Today we have a little bit of a reverse engineering project and what we have to make are uh, parts that look a little bit like this. This is a test piece that is scrap. What these are, they are the light source for a one, one arc second Seattle light from Kern, Switzerland. This is a different Kern than the milling machine company or also the lathe company. The original one is, is brass. We're going to use stainless steel for a very good reason here. What this is, it holds a light bulb in here. It has an Edison thread back here. Edison thread is a round, full round profile thread that's used on the back end of normal light bulbs too. Uh, usually these threads are roll formed in sheet metal. So we have to make this end. Then it's all hollowed out until here. There is a green glass filter in there that the customer will put in there himself. Then we have this little end here. This here, this is an M4.5 by 0.5 millimeter fine thread. And on, on this demo piece, it broke off. Uh, normally it's this long, like this one and this is broken off. I also milled this one in half. And you can see the upper one and the lower one look different in this area too, because this one has a shroud pressed on. This is a 0.25 millimeter wall thickness piece of pipe that gets pressed onto here, on this diameter here. Uh, we will make that too and press it on too. Yeah, that, that's the machining. Basically it's two, two sided turning and one operation on the milling machine to drill those three holes. Here is the full 3D model of the part we're going to make. Edison thread back here, all straight turning here, a little bit of a chamfer here, and here is the M4.5 by 0.5 millimeter fine thread. If you look on the inside, let's put on a section view, you can see that it's drilled all the way down, then we turn a step in here, then drilled and reamed through. Uh, let's turn on the other parts and section view. So here you can see the shroud. The blue part here is the shroud that gets pressed on. And we also have the green glass filter in here. Hold in place by a split ring behind it. When we turn on off section view and we look down here, you can see that this ring is split. It will be turned a little bit oversized, split and then pushed in. So it's holding the glass in there by spring force. Yeah, that's, that's basically all of it. We have to make the housing, the shroud and the split ring. And each, each of the parts 10 times, of course. Also made a 2D drawing of, of this contraption. A lot of dimensions. I dimensioned it in a way that in the way I'm going to machine it. So it's a little bit convoluted, but I have to work with it, not you. Also, I included the, an excerpt from the standard for the E10 thread that we need to put on here. We're finally at the lathe and I have some 12 millimeter 303, 14305 stainless steel held in 5C collet. So let's set the stick out. Need about 20 millimeters, so stick out 25 millimeters. I have a little bit of room against the face of the collet. Tighten it down. And the first tool is a CCMT02 insert, 0.2 millimeter corner radius. It's normally a finishing insert, but I use it for light roughing and finishing. And we'll turn down the OD to 10 millimeters and face the end. Not much to do here. Took it down to 10.4 millimeters. Then I took a 0.2 millimeter pass. Now it should be at 10.2. I'm going to measure that and check it against my my DRO and adjust accordingly. 10.18. So I'm going to hit, type that into my DRO and take my final cut to 10 millimeters. So I do this though that the two last cuts that I take are the same thickness, roughly a few micron here and there don't matter. 
but that way the cutting pressure is always the same and I will hit my dimension fairly accurate. Ten point oh nine. Next step will be to cut the groove for the threading. Thread relief that is. We have a two millimeter wide parting blade. I'll pick up the end of the part with the insert. When you do that, be absolutely light touch on the feed hand wheel or it will chip the insert. Some people will tell you that it's an absolute no-go to touch off with a carbide insert with the part not running, but I've done this so often and I know my inserts. So uh, let's groove this down to 8 millimeters. There we go. Move over 0.5 millimeter because the the thread relief as on the real part is 2.5 millimeter wide. Solid carbide chamfering tool. 0.6 millimeter chamfer on the left side, one millimeter chamfer on the right side. We need this for threading. Now for the most fun part threading with the Edison number 10 threading tool that we ground in another video or will grind in another video I'm not sure yet okay I set the lathe to 14 tpi or 1.81 something 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 millimeter per revolution running at about 200 rpm and we just take a scratch pass first yeah. And that's why we take a scratch pass. We need to go to another uh, change gear setting because previously I did for power feeding and not for threading. This is not a problem because the OD of the section that gets threaded is heavy in diameter anyways. We will cut it down using the threading tool to 9.5 millimeters, so we won't see this little accident here anymore. Okay, let's take a new scratch pass. Let's find a caliper. Yeah, that's 1.8. Okay, let's go. Let's cut the thread. So at this point the threading tool starts to cut the OD in addition to the rest of the thread form. And let's get the camera in a little bit closer. Now we just need to go down to 9.5 millimeter OD and I can easily measure that with a micrometer. A little bit of cutting oil. This is a forming cut. Either flood coolant, constant stream of flood coolant or cutting oil works best for this. 
just sprinkling on a little bit of water soluble coolant doesn't cut it here. Haha, <laughs> cut it. Two spring passes. There we go. I have the part that goes on here, right here. As you can see, it has the Edison thread on the inside. And this is about the fit that you can expect from an Edison thread. That's threading done. Here we have our drill chuck as usual. A spotting drill. For ID boring, I have this P Horn uh, Super Mini boring board. This can go in a bore starting at 3 mm up to a depth of 16 and a little bit millimeters. Uh, very nice boring bore. I just took a 20 micron cleanup pass on the end of the part just to just because the finish wasn't really sufficient or I didn't like the finish. The finish was absolutely serviceable but well I didn't like it. So let's cut this hole to six millimeters plus 50 micron. We can do that in one pass. Uh, these are the chips this boring bar can produce. Very nice. Okay, checking the ID. Three point internal micrometer. 6.01. 6.01. 6.01. So we're at the lower end of the tolerance. Very close to nominal. I will leave it like that. Uh, yeah, of course I... I dialed the tool in before on, on a test piece and now I'm just running the numbers on the DRO. What I just did is I bore, I drilled from here to here, so my my drill tip ended right in this position. Then I came back with a boring bar, 
started here, drilled all the way down or bored all the way down, 6 millimeter. that's the 601 millimeter dimension that I measured. And then I came back and bored from here to here, 6.3 millimeter. this is just a relief on the back. Small solid carbide chamfering tool. Just for a tiny edge break in there. Again the solid carbide chamfering tool because I forgot to chamfer this single edge here. Okay, second to last step, scotch Bright, of course. No, not scotch Bright. Kratex, the rubber bonded abrasive. The Kratex is just there to even out all the surface finish. So let's check our dimensions before we part it off. This is important. Should be 9.5, it's 9.496. Good enough. This should be 10 millimeters. It's 9 micron oversized, good enough. And all the other dimensions are non-critical. Here's our parting plate. It's one of those triangular P-horn 312 series parting blades with an angle ground onto the end of the blade. You can see that it has on a leading corner on the right side. It means it will not leave much of a, a parting residue on the part. So let's touch off here on the end of the part. When we touch off, we enter the width of the blade into the DRO, in this case one millimeter. And then we move over the dimension that we want to part off, the remaining length that we need and want. There we go, there is our parted up object. Now do this 10 times more, or 9 times, and then we come back for the backside operation. So, got all 10 plus 1 parts turned from one side and parted off. Now we can put the lathe back into the normal change gear setting that I need for metric threading. The 14 TPI setting on this lathe is you need a complete different set of change gears for that and those don't correspond with any of the metric feet so we have to go back there and then we can pre-stage our tools to do all the second side work this is this is something i started some time ago i have some i, I keep a folder around in a shop with important technical documentation for example i have a sheet for my rotary table and my dividing head where I have a, a note on the gear ratio and which hole, hole discs, um, dividing discs I have for the vertex rotary table and for the Walter dividing head. Then I have a sheet for chamfer sizes and the, the leg height here, so I don't have to calculate this all the time for common size chamfers. Same for radii, if I want to cut a radii on the mill with a, with a radius cutter and I want to pre-chamfer the corner to take some load off the, off the radius mill. I have the change gear t tables for my lathe here. Drawing for the soft jaws on my soft jaw chuck for the lathe. Uh, well, this is the uh, certificate for my surface plate. 
I keep uh, the manual for the through deep probe and the manual for the for the 25 millimeter one micron meter to you indicator because this thing is complicated uh, I also keep keep a sheet on on the relation between feet corner radius of an of an insert and the cusp height or the, the achievable surface roughness in RA or RC around if I have to, to cut surface with a, a very specific uh, surface finish. Uh, this is also important for threading. At a certain point when you do threading with an, with an insert, you need to tilt the insert in the helix angle of the thread. Better, better threading insert holders have a shim that can be exchanged in 0.5 degree increments. And here you have the relationship between the pitch, the thread diameter, and this gives you your shim that you have to use. 0.5, 1.5, 2.5 and so on degree shims. Uh, this is out of the Hoffman Tools catalog. This is just the daughter sheet for one of the large chamfer mills that I have. So just so I, I know what insert it uses. A little bit of technical data. This is evolving and this is also very, very uh, depending on your shop and your equipment that you have. But it's a good idea to have something like this. In the vein of technical documentation and trying to organize things, this is all also something I made. I showed this, I think, in one of the earlier videos, but didn't really talk about it. <laughs> I will put a link to the file as a PDF, as a Word or Office 365 and OpenOffice document down in the description. Uh, many of my old links are broken, yes, but I'm working, I'm, I'm using a, a DocuWiki system that I hope to keep for a longer time current so I will put this down there um, I have the standard ISO material numbers on here I have the uh, trivia name or whatever you call it where you can see the alloy components and I have the NC or ASI numbers like in uh, 304, 303, 316, 316 Ti for the stainless. I have the hardness in the as delivered condition in uh, hardness Brunel and I have the uh, tensile strength RM in Newton per square millimeters as usual for all these materials. Of course these materials on this list this is the common material in my shop Lots of tool seals, pretty much stainless and some some copper, coppery materials. And also I have a, a note back here if it's a specialized material or what it is at all. Like in this case, X100 CRMO 5-1 is A2, is a, a tool steel for, for punching, punch and die and is air hardening. This is only available in English. I'm honestly not going to translate it. <laughs> Google Translate will do a good, good job, I think. But maybe this is an idea of, of, a, of a material data sheet that you can put together yourself for the materials you use. Okay, time to pre-stage the tools. We need to change this tool, the Horn 312 parting or grooving tool holder. This currently has a parting blade with five degree lead angle this way so this the right tip of, of the blade cuts first in the material and you get a part without much parting remains on it so let's take out the original blade I used to have a shop made holder with a central screw but to be honest it worked fine it held up very good but when you have to change the inserts a lot back and forth this arrangement with the top clamp is way better now it changed to a worn, to a very worn 1.3 millimeter wide blade. Goes in here. And of course we don't cut with a worn tool. That's a 
not a good idea. We take this over to the surface grinder and just touch off the end because this won't cut it. Oh. We're over at the surface grinder and I started recently to use to regrind the, the lathe tools just by keeping them in the multifix holder and holding the multifix in either a vise here on the surface grinder or in the vise on the tool and cutter grinder. I'm not using the tool and cutter grinder because that's set up for deeper grinding at the moment and this machine already has. And I can set my angles here by tilting the device on the table or rotating the device on the table with angled blocks against the fence by tilting the multifix holder in the device and also I have the additional freedom of tilting the head of the grinder. Currently this is tilted five degrees off normal. This is a five degree angle block. Now we put in our multifix holder like this and we tighten it down. Uh, it would be nice if the angle block was either a little bit less tall or the vise was a little bit wider so I could grab the multifix on both ends but since we're just grinding and force of the wheel is pushing the, the multifix against the, the angle block back here that's fine. Now we need to tilt the grinding wheel back to zero degree and just clean off the end of this insert. Okay, pins are pulled. Let's loosen this central screw like this. Find the tapered bores. And tighten this lightly. So tighten the wheel head back in place. Have the nuts just finger tight against the casting so they don't rattle loose and the head is to zero degree. I already have a hundred millimeter D75 diamond wheel. D75 is a little bit finer than the usual D126 that I have. My regular diamond wheel that I use is a D126 which is about twice as coarse as the wheel I have in there right now. And while I'm thinking about this since I have so many multifix tool holders, I have close to 30 by now and I have two grinders and I do a lot of tool grinding. I, I was thinking about getting a, a second hand multifix base holder, the, the head, and mount it on an angle bracket that fits the tool and cutter grinder on its dovetail or that I could put either in a vise on the surface grinder or on the magnet of the surface grinder just to make tool grinding very repeatable and very fast if I have to regrind the tool mid, mid work. But that's just an idea. Okay, there we go. That's the front clearance surface all cleaned up all the way to the cutting edge. This is a threading tool with, these are ER16 threading insert, means 16 millimeter corner to corner length. And E is for external. You can also get I inserts. IR, IL uh, for internal threads. IR is for external thread right handed. EL would be external left handed. You can use this left handed too if you flip it upside down, I think, because the inserts, the way they are mounted, as you can see, they are tilted in, in two directions. This won't work in this configuration for a left hand thread. That's the drawback of these insert holders. But the quality of threads they produce is a very big advantage. And the insert I have in here is a 0.5 millimeter pitch full profile insert. It means it will cut root and crest of the thread 
and finish the OD of the thread perfectly fine without creating nasty burrs or something like that. That's especially important with such a small fine thread that's hard to deburr. I did that in the past and not, not funny. So that, that's the threading tool. Uh, I like this a lot. This has the replaceable shim with the different angle settings here. Uh, you loosen the screw and then you can pull the shim out and replace it with different ones. Another tool we need is a 35 degree chamfer tool. This can cut a chamfer and an OD at the same time. This front edge here is ground with a little bit of uh, trailing angle, clearance angle this way and also to the bottom so it can cut an, not only a chamfer but also a, a diameter. It acts as a turning tool with a, with a 35 degree angle. And lastly, we need a different turning tool. If on the first side I use the CCMT02 insert with a 0.2 millimeter corner radius and this corner radius is too big in this case. So I'm going to use this beauty of a tool. This is hand carved <laughs> on freehand on a diamond wheel. As you can see, it's just a ground clearance with a absurd chip breaker in there then lapped on the diamond wheel or on the on the diamond hone. I have a little problem on the front side of the part. It has this M4.5 by 0.5 millimeter pitch fine thread on it and I have the insert to turn it and I was thinking with the full profile insert I can just micrometer this diameter and turn the other diameter but what if this thread is worn or something like that? I can't measure, measure the diameter over wires because I don't have thread wires that small and I have no way, I have no other way of gauging the thread. So I was looking around in my tool stash, I was looking for a small ID boring threading bar and I didn't have one so could have ground one but thinking a little bit farther I knew that I have a M3 thread mill, full profile thread mill. Thread mill full profile means it has the pitch built in it and M3 is 0.5 millimeter pitch so I can use this to to mill a M4.5 internal thread. That's not a problem, same pitch. So I already prepared a piece of, of stainless, drilled out the back just so I don't have to thread all the way through and still have a little bit more material in the hand. So now I'm going to hold it like this, face it, drill it about four millimeters, and then set up the thread mill on, <laughs> on a life tool and thread mill a gauge ring. <laughs> oh wow. I have the thread mill loaded in the router spin level, run it at about 12 and a half thousand RPM. First I will keep the lathe spindle stationary and touch off with the end mill in the board just to get a diameter reference where, from where I'm starting. Now I'm engaging the feet and the half nuts to set my thread threading feet and turn on the rudder spindle and run the lace spindle very slowly and mill my way into it. Then I will move the threading tool inwards and reverse the spindle of the lathe to move it out again. Oh. Okay, there's that. That was try number one. I might have been a little bit optimistic with my depth of cut on this, <laughs> on this thread mill. Okay, gladly. This is not my only option. So let's get this out of the spindle. So usually I show how things went or I, sh I show what worked in the end, but I think I can show here that not all goes well in my shop. So 
if I had to buy this end mill, this would be a 250 buck end mill. Bummer. I, I got this in a tool all day. Know pretty much exactly where I got that from. Okay, let's try this red whirler. This is a shop ground one. I have used it in the past, it worked, but I have never used it in stainless. I think. Let's break the next cover. I have some more options if that doesn't work. Maybe higher RPM on the tool. This is working better than I expected. As you can see, this is forming a thread. Unfortunately, this is not a full profile cutter, so I have to keep track of my... I have to bore the ID larger, because the cutter cannot cut it. But apart from that, it will work, and I can just match it until until my my uh, sample part fits. So I'm, I'm making a comparator gauge here, basically. <laughs> so yeah. So I will do off camera some milling passes and be back. I think I nailed the dimension. Get the router motor out of the way. Our sample part. And this is a... A nice instrument type thread fit. Very nice. So, I can use this as a thread gauge now. <laughs> okay. Before you comment, no, this is not a thread gauge that would be usable on any part or on any part with this thread. It's only usable in combination with these parts because uh, now I know they are matched. I'm basically copying this part. This is not like, entirely the proper way to do it. The real proper way would be to buy a M4.5 by 05 thread gauge, a go and a no go gauge ring. But knowing what this is for and how this all goes together this will do this will be very very adequate and i can be sure to ship parts that will fit okay since we collected all the necessary tools together now it's time to to start cutting some material so i can hold the parts that we pre-machine from one side on the od of the e10 thread the OD I, I, mich I finished to 9.5 mm and I have a 9.5 mm 5C collet, so this is enough surface area to, get, to grab this part securely without damaging it. The only thing, since it's so short, we have to double check the run out because we have a little bit of stick out there and so we're just bringing in the indicator and double check the run out. So that's 30 micron. Let's see if we can... OK. 
Okay. Okay, that's 10 micron. And that's zero. Let's see, when we fully tighten the collet, it's probably going to shift around like crazy. Okay, that's, that's in the 10 micron range. I tightened the, the chuck on the part or the collet on the part lightly, tapped it in and then tightened it fully. And I made sure that I used the same pinion drive for light tightening and then final tightening. Otherwise, if you use on, on this kind of chuck, the pinions alternating, the large gear that has the thread for the 5C collet in it that pulls the collet into the, the taper seat, it will shift around if you use the the other pinion. And that will influence the run out. If you use always the same for pre-tightening, indicating and then final tightening, it will not move really much around. We start by taking a light facing cut, then we take the part out of the truck again, measure the overall length and then we cut it to final length. Okay, just a light facing pass to clean up the, the S parted off surface. <laughs> this of course means that I have to re-indicate it after this. So if I hadn't forgotten to do the cutting the part to length first, I wouldn't have to indicate it twice. 21.14. The part goes back, light tightening, indicator, There we go. Okay, tighten it fully. Okay, took, uh, took my first cut and now I'm going to double check the dimension that this tool turns comparing to the DRO 9.83 so I need to adjust 9.83. I had to adjust the DRO. So this should be 9.5 now. Yeah, this tool is not very good at breaking chips, but it's cutting extremely free with low cutting pressure that, and has a tiny corner radius. So 4.93, that's good. And I can cut all the other dimensions too. Okay, and this should be 7.5. Seven point four nine seven. None of these dimensions, apart from the nine point five, that was the first step that we turned, is really critical. <laughs> uh, but still, it's nice to hit dimensions. Okay, change it to a thirty-five degree chamfer tool. I already scratched out here on the diameter. Set it to the diameter of the part. Now I move away, go into the final diameter, 5.5. And now we'll hit the edge of the part. Okay, and that's my zero now. And now I can back off and turn it down to final shoulder length in small increments and hit my correct shoulder depth with the chamfer.
Okay, this should be 5.5. 5.495. Again, tool change to a parting tool or grooving tool. That's the one that I resharpened on the surface grinder. We move it up against the face of the part, just lightly touching, zero out the DRO, and move in our three millimeters as per drawing. And one last time back to the OD turning tool and finish or pre-finish the diameter where we put the thread on because this is very much oversized. Fine cut needle file. And here we are with the threading tool. Okay, I have my thread gauge ready. So let's see, let's start this. Okay, this is not even close. Now I'm sneaking in in 50, mi 50 micron increments. Okay, closer. That might be, might be the ticket. These small threads are extremely susceptible to small changes in diameter, so I'm not going to take 50 micron off. Only taking 30 micron now. This is just on the first one to figure out my fit. Okay, there we go. And some Kratex work.
clean the abrasive grid off with some alcohol. Second to last step is to run a boring bar through there. The boring bar is only there to make the bore run true to the geometry that we created. Chamfering. And the last one is a 3mm rima just to give all the bores on all the parts very fast and very easy the same size without having to muck around with a boring bar. There we go. So and here is the first of the parts of the lathe. All work on the lathe is done. Deburred. Everything's chamfered, nicely rounded, decent surface finish. Uh, the ID is machined. Front bore is reamed. Now we need to put in the three holes. And later we will put the shroud on. So, so the front section of these two parts will look the same. You can see in the gap of the shroud you can see one, two, three holes. If we look in from this side, you can see those holes too. We need to drill those after the milling machine with, a, with the indexing head. And then we have to make this shroud. This will be a fun part too. That's going to get pressed on. That's the overall setup. I have the 5C indexer where I milled two flats on the cast body so I'm able to hold it in a vise without having to remove the vise and bolt it down directly to the table. This is way faster. Should have done this way earlier, by the way. And I have a collet in here, same collet that we used on the lathe, to hold these parts on the, on the thread again. And now I'm using a dial test indicator to center in the y direction onto this diameter. So I'm sweeping here. That's zero. That's zero. And now we move the table free, clear, spin the indicator 180 degrees, and we take a look on the indicator from the other side. And move in. Spin the indicator to get my, my peak. And that's also zero, means I'm already zeroed in the y direction. If I move it off center, my, my zero shifts, of course, but I don't want that. I want zero. And that way I can find the center of this part. Indicator out of the way. I could use the dial test indicator to pick up the, the zero on the end too, but uh, there is another tool that we can use. That's one tool change away. So I finally broke down and I bought myself a Heimer 3D probe. And these are quite nice. Well, in the past I said I don't like them very much because they tend to not be crazy reliable for high precision work, but for general purpose edge finding on parts, it's really fast and also not very not only very fast but also very it has a high confidence in the measurement because you have a very large dial where you see your approach against the part and also you can find high spots by by dropping the indicator like this so we find the high spot because we have 
a drilled hole and chamfer and all, all sorts of features combined here on the face of this part, I'm finding the high spot like this, lock the quill, and now I move in until the red needle hits zero and the black one hits zero too. And then the center of the spindle is exactly above the end of the part. This tool is nice, it's really nice to have, but to be honest, not necessary for mill work. I took a 12 millimeter set screw end mill holder like this one and I cut off most of it to shorten it down to make a very stub length well done holder, a set, set screw type holder and I put a new set screw in here. I drilled and, and tapped into this, <laughs> this is bloody hardened, uh, it's case hardened but relatively deep so I had to use a carbide countersink to remove all the case hardening before I could tap in there. And that way I got this very compact shank for the Heimer 3D Pro. They make an integral shank one, but I want the option to use this Heimer without the shank on my CNC mill too. So then I have a ER11 collet chuck here with a 2.5 mm carbide drill. Using the carbide drill because I need a little bit more stick out here. So I clear the collet face, which is a little bit tapered. And also I don't need to spot drill with these because they are so rigid. And uh, the, the geometry of the drill is such that it doesn't tend to wander off. So now we just move in the correct uh, amount and drill three holes and try not to, to hit either our colored nut or the colored face here against each other. So, time to deburr. I have, this is a mounted stone that you would regularly use in a die grinder. And I want to reach into here and deburr those cross holes. So I'm, I'm putting this, this ball shaped stone in here in a, in a pin vise, spinning it just by hand, pressing it in the cross hole and just using it like, like a sanding tool. Hard to do that on camera. Like this, then I just roll roll it in the, in the cross hole and put a nice internal chamfer on it. This is really hard to film because I would like to hold my hands differently, but then you can't see anything. So then we do that to all of the three cross holes. Then I lose my will to film this. Ugh, oh, terrible to film. Okay, you get the idea. You use the stone, uh, spin it by hand in there, put a tiny chamfer on the inside. So you get the idea. Uh, you take the stone, you put it in the cross hole, you spin it back and forth a little bit until you deburr the cross hole. That was step one. Step two is a triangular scraper and we just take a tiny, tiny cut along the edge of the cross hole on the outside. Just like this. Just put a tiny chamfer on there and remove the burr. Go in two passes or in, in two steps, 180 degrees, reset 180 degrees, like wood carving, just in metal.
Then we can take a, a small mounted Kratex stick. We could put it, put it in, in a die grinder, but I want just to remove any hairline burrs that are left. Now we go over to the drill press and use a abrasive brush on the inside. Okay, other side of the shot. This is an abrasive brush. The material is a nylon that's impregnated with, I think it's silicon carbide abrasive, and it's fairly stiff bristles. And this fits like a good, good, slot, good, good heavy sliding fit into this part. So we're under set 3000 RPM and just and then we just work the inside of the bore a little bit. Running it first clockwise and counterclockwise or vice versa. Depending on the orientation of the burr Changing the direction might help to remove it. So that was all the deburring on this part. Everything else was already done in a lathe using Kratex and fine needle file when we machined the part. Now we need, uh, need to clean up the back side of the lampshade before we press it on, and I'm just using a stone. This is a regular bench, bench stone. To clean up the back side where we parted it off. And again with a triangular scraper, we just remove the burr that was pushed in there from parting it off. Also, this side that I parted off, that, that side was at the parting blade, this will go down onto the seat where it's pressed on so it will be never seen again or touched again. The other side is where we did a proper deburring job on the lathe. So I made this arbor here to, to press these two parts together on this tiny Schmidt arbor press. So the part goes on, the lampshade goes on the body here like this, then both slide into the arbor and there is a contour turn into the arbor, this is made out of Delrin, and it aligns everything to each other. And then I just drop it down onto this, this hardened ground block down here. So when I retract the arbor, you can see how, how all this is aligned now together. And I can use all of my will strength now to push these parts together. There we go. That was all. That was it. That's it. That's part assembled, nicely pressed together. I have the lampshade around here, looking good to me. So here we are with one, two, three, four, five, five of them already finished with the lampshade pressed on. A few more to go. We'll do that off camera. I machined all the lampshades for these parts, pressed them all on. The parts are all done. The only thing that left is the small ring with the split in it. Not going to show it. it it's really a dead simple part. It's just drill, turn the OD part off, and then slid it with a thin abrasive disc on the surface grinder. Or maybe a slitting saw. Really not worth showing. But here are the collimator lamp housings with their shroud ready to be shipped out. I have to say this was a fairly interesting project. Funny, funny part with the E10 thread and the thin pressed on shroud. Had, had, had a blast making these. Hope you enjoyed me showing you these parts. Thank you all for watching and I'll be back.